If you get your Bibles, why don't you open those up to James chapter 4. We're going to be there in just a minute. James chapter 4. We're continuing a series that we've been going through all summer, if you've been with us or if you've not. We've been looking through the, the book of James. Uh, James is a letter. It's not a book as we read today. It had chapters and verses and, and headings over the different paragraphs. It was written initially as a letter uh, from James, who is the pastor of the Jerusalem church, to his people that had been scattered throughout the region because of persecution. And so James was writing to them to give them practical steps to live by. And one thing I want you to notice that we've seen throughout the book is oftentimes James will appear to bounce from one topic to the other, but really there's a lot of uh, kind of theming underneath all of that. I think today you're going to see a great example of that as well, where James sort of wraps up a lot of the things we've been looking at uh, with the passage we're looking at today. Um, so we be getting, thinking about that and getting ready for that. I, I want to say thanks to you. Amy and I have had some time to be away the last couple of weeks. Uh, we were went to the beach as a family this past week down in the Gulf Shore area of Alabama, and that was great just to get away. And the week before that, we had a nice, refreshing, relaxing week with junior high students at the junior high camp. Nothing says peaceful sleep like, you know, 50 boys in the cabin with you. So that's always great. A lot of feet smell and all that kind of stuff. So I had that week, weekend, which was great, that week, which is great. But before that, we were on July 4th, we went to see some family. And so we've been on the road a lot, been traveling a lot. And um, one of the things that, that my children got opportunities to be part of that they hadn't before is at our house, we have like the cheapest cable known to man. It's like $9.99 a month. I just, just fought with a cable company this past week and said, they said, we don't have the $9.99 plan anymore. Well, then cancel it. Well, let me see. Hey, hey, look, I found another plan, just like the one you had, they said. So we had to fight through all of that. So every six months, I have to re-up the 999 because that's one of the cheapest. I don't want to pay for anything else, which means we have no extra channels. We have like the ABC, NBC, and C-SPAN or something. It's like nothing. We have no channels at all, you know. And kids love C-SPAN. So we, had, we, have, we have that. And so we went to my mom and dad's house. And my dad has every channel ever known on this planet, on his system. That's the deal. You know, you go to the little chart, we flip through the direct TV or whatever, it has a little chart, and the ones, channels you have are one color, and the channels you don't have are a different color. Not in my dad's house. It's all the same color. He has every channel known to man. You know, that kind of deal. And so my kids get to see all these different opportunities, all these different, you know, 28 cartoon channels or whatever. And then we went to Amy's grandma's, and same deal. She has every channel that's ever been purchased in the history of the world. So, so my kids got an opportunity to see all these channels. And one of the evils in this world that I was unaware of until this week, or last couple weeks, is, is bubble guppies. Anybody aware of bubble guppies? <laughs> Anybody of you have seen bubble guppies? Why didn't you warn me about this? I had no idea this was coming to me. Uh, Bubble Guppies is this show that my four-year-olds are now obsessed with, and there's a little theme song that goes along with it. My kids know by heart, and they sing it in the car over and over and over, and just a few words, and it just kind of drives into to the gray matter, begins to leak out of my ear, you know, as I'm driving down the down the road. So my girls are listening to Bubble Guppies, and so we, went, we had Bubble Guppies at my mom and dad's house, and then went to Amy's grandma's, more Bubble Guppies, and then and so on the way back from uh, Alabama Friday. We get in the car, it's an eight hour trip. Before we get to the interstate, the Bubble Guppies theme song starts from my two girls in the back seat. We've got eight hours ahead of us. This is not going to be good, you know? Not even to the interstate yet. And so they're going along, and I'm just kind of gripping the wheel, praying to Jesus for serenity and all those kind of things. This is going to be a long trip. And so we're going along a little farther. Well, the singing turns into a fight about which one of them is which bubble guppy. Apparently there's different colors to the bubble guppies. Is this, anybody know that? Is this true? And so uh, Karen and Erica both wanted to be the purple bubble guppy because that's really important, I guess. And so they both want to be the purple bubble guppy. And so they're fighting back and forth about which one gets to be the purple bubble, bubble guppy. It's hard to say. And which one doesn't get to be the purple bubble guppy. And they're fighting with each other in the back seat. Uh, and so I'm thinking to myself, this is not going to be good. This is not good. Well, fast forward that ahead two or three minutes. And now Erica, the diva in the family, is, is crying uncontrollably. I can't be the purple bubble guppy. Purple's my favorite color. And she's crying. Just uncontrollably. And I'm thinking, I've got eight more hours of this. This is not going to be good. So we had one of those moments where dad says, we're done with this. We're just done talking about it. We're done fighting about it. We're done whatever. But I, I had a, a moment of clarity in the middle of that where I said to myself, and I said to Amy, 
it was amazing. I had some profound thought in the middle of all this. I said, I think I understand a little better of how God sees us sometimes. Because God has to look down at us and see the things we get fired up about, the things we get angry about, and the things we fight about. In light of the whole world that's going on, he's got to wonder, what in the world's going on with you people? It's a bubble guppy, <laughs> bubble guppy moment for God. He's got to have that. Uh, I mean, you got to look down at this world and think, there are children who are dying today because they don't have enough food or because they don't have clean water or because they don't have access to basic medical stuff that we all take for granted. But then I'm going to go home this afternoon and I'm going to be fired up about my sports team or about which politician said which political point or which got that thing done or what, what's going on in the news is so important. And yet there's these really important things that I'm not going to be on my radar today. But I'll be all fired up and fighting about other things. Or, or uh, right now, you know, people in, in the church are turning away from God uh, in our country, but in rapid numbers, turning away from God in the church. And yet churches find themselves fighting over what kind of seats to have in the auditorium or what kind of music to have to sing praises back to God with or, or what kind of translation to use in the Bible. And, and God's got to be looking down saying, really? I mean, people, my kids are leaving you because they think you're irrelevant, because they think you're judgmental. And you're fighting with each other over those things? It's a bubble guppy moment for God. I just know that it is. And it's got to be something different. And I, I think in the middle of all of that, that feel, that theme, that kind of heart behind that is what James was getting at here in James chapter 4. So if you've got your Bible there in James chapter 4, please take that off the screen. That's good. I don't see bubble guppies anymore. Uh, James chapter 4. <laughs> I apologize. Any fans of bubble guppies? I've offended you. I apologize about that. All right. James chapter 4. <coughs> James says in chapter 4, verse 1, What causes fights and quarrels among you? What gets you wound up? What causes you to, to be passionate? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you, he says? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and you covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and you fight, but you do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Now, we could take the whole time here. We won't, we won't do that. We could take a lot of time here because James lays out in pretty convincing fashion what it is that causes us to, to fight with each other, what causes disagreements and battles and, and quarrels, and we all have that. You could look at any one of our houses and see these verses fleshed out as we fight with each other because we want a certain way or that way, and we, we fight with each other about it. But I think he's getting to something a little more significant than that, so I want us to go on if we can. Verse 4, he says, you adulterous people. Now this is one of those moments where James appears to be going one direction and kind of takes a, a left turn or a right turn. He says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that the spirit that God caused to live in us envies intensely? Now when you first look at that, you think, what in the world is he doing? He was talking along in, in the first couple of verses about fighting and quarreling and what causes that. And then all of a sudden he starts calling us adulterous people and saying we're being friends with the world and hating God. And, and it doesn't seem to make sense. And he talks about how God's Spirit lives in us and it envies intensely. And those are two conversations that sort of make sense. They just don't seem to go together real well. But I think James is saying a little bit tongue-in-cheek uh, a, broader, a broader message here. To get the idea of it, I think you've got to go back and see kind of the context of how he got here in his letter. Because again, this wasn't written as a, as a book with chapters and verses and headings. It was a letter that was kind of free-flowing in thought. So if you go back to chapter 2, we're going to do a real quick overview for just a minute. In chapter 2, he talks about favoritism. And he says, the natural way that you live your life is you're going to want to prioritize certain groups over others. So if someone is wealthy or someone is pretty or someone is popular or, or powerful, you're going to want special notice, special attention, and you won't give that same special attention to other groups who aren't as self-serving. But you've got to fight against that because God calls you to treat everyone lovingly and equally. So you got to, there's this there's thing that you feel is natural to you, but you've got to kind of war inside of yourself against that. And then if you skip on down to verse 14, he talks about faith and deeds, and Brian taught that a couple weeks ago real well for us. And he said, the natural way for you to live is to say, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, God and I are fine. And then not do anything at all about that. That's very natural and very um, the way that you might naturally approach that. But you've got to war inside of yourself to do something different. Because if you really have faith in God, if you really have faith in Jesus, that's got to be lived out in the way you treat people. That's got to be lived out in the way that you find people with needs and meet them. 
And so even though inside of you, you want to live one way, you've got to kind of war inside of yourself and fight inside of yourself to live a different way that God calls you to. And then chapter 3 goes on. He talks about taming the tongue. And he says the, the natural way you want to live is you want to sing praises to God if you're a follower of Jesus. And you want to say nice things about God. But then you want to use that same mouth to say ugly things to other people. So you talk one way when you're talking to God or about God. And you talk a different way when no one else is around maybe. He said, it can't be that way. You've got a war inside of yourself so that the way that you talk to God is the same consistent way you talk to people. And you get a handle on how your tongue works. Skip on down to the verses we looked at last week in verse 13. He talks about there's two different ways to live your life. He says the one way to live your life is that the way that the world says it's successful and happy and things is to acquire more and more stuff for yourself. Selfish ambition and envy. That what, that's what drives you. And so you get more and more stuff, more and more possessions, more and more money, a nicer car, a bigger house, a, a, a step up the rung on the, on the ladder at work. Now, I know this is one of those culturally sort of irrelevant passages, because who lives that way, right? I mean, no one believes today that you, you would find some happiness or success by getting more stuff, a nicer car, bigger house. No one believes that today. They believed it then. It's a little funny. It's not hysterical, but it's a little funny. They believed it then, but no one believes that now. I mean, everybody knows that's not how success really happens, right? But he said some people would actually believe that. And so you've got a war inside of yourself to say, I'm not going to live that way. I'm going to find success and peace and wisdom and happiness the way God calls me to, through humility, putting other people first, and through doing acts of service and deeds to other people. That's what really brings wisdom and success and happiness. So even though the world calls me to live one way, I'm going to call to live another. And so then all of that then leads to this conclusion in James 4. He says there's all these things you should be fighting about, all these things you should be warring with yourself on, all these things that should get you fired up. But what causes fights and quarrels among you? It's because you want more stuff. You want your way all the time. You want to get your way over somebody else. So you fight and you you've covet and you want and you quarrel and you go after these other people. So he calls us then, in response to that, you adulterous people. Because you're saying you want to live one way, but in fact you're living some way completely different. You know, he uses the phrase adulterous, and that's sort of a harsh word, but I think it's exactly what he intended to say. Because what he's saying is when you are in relationship with God, and you're committed to God, and you've given your life to God, and at the same time you want to be in relationship with the way the world does life, then you are cheating on God. Because God's calling you one direction, but you're choosing to be in relationship not only with God, but you're choosing to be in relationship with everything else the world does. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. James would say, there is a real battle going on that's worth fighting, but you're consumed with these other things. It's the bubble guppy moment. I'm sure it's in the original Greek there in James chapter 4, bubble guppy. I think it's in there. Or at least the message translation. I don't know about that. Um, James would say there's a real battle going on and it's worth fighting and he's going to tell us how to get there. But before I, before I get there, I want to make sure I say one thing. Some of you are, um, I want to say just a word to those of you who are kind of on the outside of faith looking in. You're trying to wrestle if this is something you want to do or not. We have a lot of folks in our church that are in that spot. I'm so glad you're with us because I mean to make sure that you hear clearly something that I think is not taught well a, a lot in our, in our churches. There's a semblance that we've taught to people, the churches have taught to people that says, you can have all of the things that the world offers, you can pursue all of the things the world pursues, you can do all of the stuff that drives the world, and you can add God to that, and somehow that's going to make it all work. But that doesn't work. It's, it's like someone putting your foot in one boat, and then putting your foot in a different boat, and the boat's going in different directions, and then you getting wet later and feeling like maybe the boat was wrong. It wasn't a problem with the boat. The problem was you sort of got to switch from one to the other. And Christians have taught, Christians have showed their lifestyle. I have showed with my lifestyle, erroneously, that I can do the things of the world. I can be pursue the things of the world. I can be driven by the things of the world, and I can add God to that, and somehow that's going to work. But God never said that. God always said, friendship with the world is hatred towards God. You pursue one or you pursue the other, but if you pursue both, you're going to fall in the water. And I do not, I would be so heartbroken if some of you who are here felt like you could keep doing the things that you'd always done, that always made sense, and then just sort of add God to that, and somehow that would work. Because when you fall in the water later and realize this doesn't work, you're going to assume it's the God part that doesn't work. 
It's because it, doesn't, it never was intended to work that way. And so I want to make sure that you hear that clearly. There is a battle going on, and it's worth fighting, and, I, and James is going to tell us how to win it this morning. If you look at chapter 4, look at verse 7 and 8. James tells, gives us the key here to winning these battles with inside of us. It's to submit ourselves then to God. That's the whole deal. If you want to win the battles inside of you, you've got to submit yourself to God. He goes further to tell us how to do that. It's two steps. One is resist the devil and he will flee from you. Number two is you come near to God and God will come near to you. So he gives us uh, two commands and each of them have a promise. He says you resist the devil and the devil's going to flee from you. You come near to God and God's going to come near to you. There's promises attached to both of them. So I want to take the time we can just to be real practical and look at those two pieces for just a moment. What's it mean to resist the devil? What's it mean to come near to God? Now when we talk about resisting the devil, we've got to first off kind of debunk some things. Uh, one of the things that, that I think churches struggle with these days is, is most churches don't talk at all about Satan or the devil or Lucifer, however you want to term that. And, and we've created this kind of understanding in our culture that maybe he's not even real, maybe he doesn't even exist. Or if he does exist, we have a picture of a guy in red spandex with a pointy tail and a little pitchfork and gives kids candy at Halloween or something. That's not at all. The Bible is very clear that there is a, a, an enemy that is a being that's a real, in, real uh, part of this world. And so when we don't, we, we don't talk about them, we do it to our disservice because we go through life as if there is no enemy, as if he doesn't exist. So I want to take just a few moments and talk about what we know about the devil, what we know about Satan from Scripture, and we'll kind of talk through that if we can. First of all, we know the Bible would tell us that he's real and that he's powerful. I, I, I saw this survey from George Barna that surveyed American Christians, and it said approximately 60% of American Christians don't believe that Satan exists. Maybe he's a symbol for evil, or maybe he's a metaphor, but not like, it's not like there's a real being. But for us to believe that, that means we disagree with Jesus, because Jesus talked pretty clearly as if he did exist. It means we've got to disagree with Paul, because Paul talked pretty clearly that he did exist. We've got to disagree with James, and Peter, and John, and Jude, and all four of the Gospels. I mean, to believe that Satan is not uh, real, you've got to take the last third of the Bible and just rip it out and start fresh. Because all throughout this, every book of the New Testament talks about Satan as if he's a real being, a real enemy that we need to be aware of. And the Bible says that he's powerful. So for us to pretend that we don't have an enemy that really exists is for us to go through life naively. You know, if, you, if you're to get on a plane and go over to Afghanistan and, and just pretend that the Taliban doesn't exist, that's a bad way to live your life. If you're to go to Iraq and pretend that Al-Qaeda is not really in existence and they don't really care about you being an American over there, that's really probably an unsafe way to live your life. And the Bible tells us that we have a real enemy who is powerful, who uh, we need to address. Jude, one of the shortest books in the Bible, only one page long, takes a part of that book to, to address the idea of Satan. And he says in there that there will be people who will act as if Satan is not real or not powerful. And here's his response to that in Jude chapter 9. It says, even the archangel Michael, one of the most powerful angels in existence, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him. But he said, in fact, the Lord rebuke you. Michael was not afraid of, of the devil because God is more powerful than he is, but he treated him with respect. And yet in our culture, we either act like he does not exist, or we dress him up in a Halloween outfit, or we teach our kids, one of the church songs that a lot of times people teach the kids is, we'll take the devil out and smash his face. I always cringe when I hear that song, because this verse just says, even Michael, the archangel, didn't say something slanderous to them, but then we kind of teach kids to be flippant about it. The Bible says that Satan is real and he's powerful. Another thing the Bible says clearly is that his aim is our destruction. Peter compares him to a roaring lion wanting to devour us. Jesus in John 10 says that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. There's a real enemy out there who really wants to take from you and harm you and hurt you. Now you don't need to be afraid because God is much more powerful than he is. The idea that they're somehow equal is not true from the Bible. But he does want to hurt you. And it is something that you should be aware of and be uh, concerned about. I remember a number of years ago, uh, when Michael Jordan still played basketball, he was, um, 
the Knicks were a very, uh, very tough team in those days. They had Patrick Ewing and John Starks, and some of those guys were really talented, and they were a hard team to beat, especially at home. And Michael Jordan and the Bulls came in and beat them at Madison Square Gardens, and, and Jordan that night scored 69 points. I don't know if you, any of you remember this or not, sports fans. Jordan scored 69 points. And so after the game, all these reporters were crowded around Michael Jordan's locker and all this stuff, and Will Perdue, uh, Vanderbilt grad, go to Nashville, was over by himself getting dressed because no one wanted to talk to Will Perdue. He had scored two points that night, so no one was concerned about him. And so one reporter, sort of opportunistic, I think, decided he wouldn't talk to Michael Jordan and wait in line. He'd go talk to Will Perdue for an exclusive Will Perdue interview, you know. So he goes over to Will Perdue and he says, hey, what was it like to play with Michael Jordan when he beat the Knicks? And what was it like to be here when he scored 69 points? He says, phenomenal. I mean, I'll always remember that this night. I will tell my grandkids about this night, the night that Michael Jordan and I scored 71 points to beat the Knicks. I'll always tell them about that. <laughs> Uh, you know, when you're dealing with our enemy and you've got God on your side, it's a little bit like that. You know, on our own, Satan is much more powerful than we are, and he seeks to destroy us. But with God, God's much more powerful than he is, and he knows that. He doesn't want you to know that he knows that, but he knows that. You know, this is one of those areas, though, that I want to take just a second on, because this is not a theoretical discussion. The idea that Satan wants to kill and steal and destroy, this is not theoretical. This is not just spiritual talk. You see this in your life. You see families where, where someone has chosen to follow the wrong decision, go away from God again and again, and they destroy their whole life. You see people who, because of addictions or whatever, have, have gone the wrong direction, away from God again and again and again, and destroy their whole life. You see people who have been so driven by greed and materialism, apart from God, that they've driven themselves away and destroyed their whole life. I mean, you see people following away from God, listening to the lies of the enemy, and finding themselves destroyed. Satan is, is designed to do that. Third thing we know about the devil from Scripture is that our conflicts with him come in seasons. You know, the temptations do not come constantly, steadily for your whole life with never a break. They come and go. You see this in the, in the life of Jesus. Jesus was being tempted by uh, the devil out in the wilderness. And three different times, Satan came and presented a temptation, a way to go away from God. And three different times, Jesus said no to that and put scripture in there to, to refute that. And then the second time, and then the third time. And then it says in Luke chapter 4, verse 13, when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left Jesus until an opportune time. He left him, and then he came back again, and then he left him, and he came back again. And you see this in your life. There's times when you're, when you're really struggling with something, a temptation that you know God doesn't want you to do. Maybe it's your anger. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's, it's uh, something with your kids. Maybe it's something with greed. I don't know what it is. But you've got a temptation, and you really deal with it, and you struggle with it. And then all of a sudden you feel like, man, i kind of got a handle on this. This is not that hard anymore. I've really got this under control. And you sort of pay, quit paying attention to it. And then a month later, or two months later, out of nowhere, something comes, and your guard's down, and it knocks you out. Our battle with Satan comes in seasons. They don't come steadily, so be aware of that. Fourth thing that's really important for this morning is when we resist him, we know he has to flee. The promise you get from Scripture is when you are tempted by Satan and you resist that, he's bound by God to flee. He can't keep at you. So when you find yourself being drawn to do something you don't want to do, Find yourself resisting it aggressively. Take it personal. A fight has been picked with you. And God's watching. And, and when you resist, the, he has no option but to flee. Second piece of this is not only resist the devil, he will flee from you, but come near to God and God will come near to you. A common theme throughout Scripture is that resisting evil, resisting temptation is not enough by itself. There's got to be a second piece to that. If you resist the things you shouldn't do or don't want to do and don't do anything of God to draw near to God, then you're sort of setting yourself up. You're sort of a, a lame duck out there. You must pursue God. This is all the way throughout Scripture, but 2 Timothy is a great example of this. Paul says in verse 22, Run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. Instead, Pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. So don't just refrain from doing wrong, but pursue God. Go after God. In fact, Jesus in Matthew 12 even says when, when someone resists Satan but doesn't pursue God in the, in the meantime, he kind of creates a vacuum and, and the end result is worse than the beginning. You've got to kind of do both sides of this. This is the battle that's worth fighting that James tells us about. And the promise here 
Just like there's a promise with the first command, there's a promise here. The promise here is when you draw near to God, God in turn will come and draw near to you. And this is really good news. Because some of you have been through a lot of rough stuff. And you've done things you're not proud of. And you're doing things maybe now you're not proud of. And there's things in your life that are not the way you want them to be. And so you may say, I, I, can, I can try to turn away from that, but God would never take me back if I went to Him. God would never accept me. I've done too much. I've gone too far. I've ran away too much. But the promise from God here in James is when you come near to God, God will return, come near to you. He won't just wait passively for you to arrive. He will pursue you. And that's really good news. Really good news. A couple weeks ago when we were at, at junior high camp, the, the theme for the whole week uh, was about the prodigal son. And they, they'd spent time in Luke 15. All, every, every one of those, the chapel services at night, they would talk about the prodigal son and different parts of it. And if you're not familiar with that story, it's, a, it's about a man who has two sons. And the one son said to his dad, I don't want to be with you anymore. Just give me my money, give me my stuff, and I'm going to go live my own life. And so the father gives him some of his property, gives him some of his inheritance, and he goes and he wastes it all on wild living with prostitutes and parties and craziness. And then once all the money was gone, all of his friends leave, and he's left alone. He finds himself feeding slop to hogs, and he looked at the slop in there that he was feeding to the hogs, and he wished he could have some of it because it was better than what he was eating himself. And he remembered his dad, and he remembered the way he treated his servants, let alone his sons. And he said, maybe if I could just be my dad's servant... I would improve my life. I'll, I'll go do that. And I'll go and apologize. I'll grovel. I'll throw myself at my dad's feet. And so when he's a long ways off, he, he sees his dad and his dad sees him. And his dad doesn't do what a, a, a patriarchal Jew of that time would do and stand patiently and stay. His dad takes off running for his son. And he runs to his boy, the one who had said, I don't want you in my life. You're better off dead. I, I don't want you around. That son, he ran to him and he loved on him and he accepted him. And he threw a wild party that night to say, let's celebrate my son who is dead and is alive again. And that's our story. That all of us have chosen to reject God. All of us have chosen to go our own way. All of us have chosen to leave the way God wants us to live. And He can at any time take us back. And any time we draw near to God, God will in turn draw near to us. Now I want you to notice that He lives out the verses in James in that story. The prodigal doesn't just reject the pigs and reject the slop and reject that way of living. He in turn says, I'm going to reject that, but I'm also going to pursue my father. I'm going to pursue my dad. And when he did, God did just what James said he would do. God came near to him. And it's our story. The speaker that week at junior high camp I thought was really insightful. He talked about the word prodigal that we always label this son with. The word prodigal means extravagant on bordering on reckless. And that's clearly how this boy lived. He took the money from his dad that his dad shouldn't have even given to him. He took that money and he was extravagant with it and he wasted it and he was bordering on reckless and wild living and all of this. And so prodigal is a good association for that boy. It's a good label for that son. But the speaker that week said prodigal really is more accurately assessed to the father. Because the father who had everything, who didn't need to give up any of it, chose to give half of what he owned to his son, and then his son went and blew it all, and when his son came back, he didn't accept his son's offer of service, he, he welcomed him back as a son. He didn't stand back and wait for the son to come, he ran to him, bordering on reckless. He was extravagant in his love for his boy. We serve a prodigal God, a reckless, extravagant God. And when he looks down at you, when he looks down at me, he sees all the junk in our life, all the junk you've ever done, all the junk you're doing now, all the junk you're going to do. He sees it all. And it burdens him and pains him because he knows we are listening to lies that are going to destroy us if we listen to him long enough. But when we, re when we reject that, and he holds Satan to leave and he'll flee from you. And when he, we come back to God, when we draw near to God, God won't wait passively for us. He will run to us. Because He loves us. I want you to bow your heads and let's pray together. God, we thank You that You are our prodigal God. That You're extravagant in Your love for us. That You're reckless in the way that You accept us back again and again. We don't deserve, us, we don't deserve for You to accept us the first time. 
But God, in my case, you've accepted me again and again and again, and I keep messing up, and I keep doing the wrong thing, and I keep doing things that I'm not proud of and that you, you're not proud of, and you take me back every time, just like you said you would. So God, help us this morning uh, to re resist the things that are holding us back. God, the things that seek to destroy us, the things that take us away from you, the things that, that are killing us and stealing from us and destroying our lives. God, help us to resist those things. And I really believe that, God, that you are not only able to speak to us in big, broad terms, but you can speak to us individually. And so I ask, God, that you would, just now even, if there's things in our life that we need to, to root out, things in our life we need to resist very specifically, I pray that you'd point those things out to us. That we would know what it is that, that's destroying us. We'd know the lies we're listening to because you'd point them out to us right now. And then God, even more importantly, I pray that we would run to you. That we'd take our sin, our mistakes, our shame, and we'd bring it to you and we'd give it to you and we'd ask for your forgiveness and for your power and for your healing. And we could experience just like that boy our powerful, mighty, distinguished, awesome Father throwing caution to the wind and running towards us. God, for some, they may need to experience that today for the first time. They've kept you at arm's distance because of their pride or because of their sin or because of their embarrassment or because of their questions. God, maybe today's the day they need to they need to resist that which holds them back and, and pursue you, knowing that when they draw near to you, you will in turn draw near to them because of Jesus. Why don't you take just a moment and pray to God just where you sit, just silently. Maybe for some of you, there's something you need to, to root out of your life. Others, you need to be more fully embracing of God. But allow God to speak to you just now and ask Him what He, he would have you do. prodigal God who accepts us back. And I pray that you would, you would receive our offerings of, of, of forgiveness, our offerings of contrition and, and uh, repentance this morning as we seek to follow you more fully. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.